major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Monday, May 18th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. President Trump admits he's been using a controversial drug to lessen the symptoms of the coronavirus. While here at home, easing regulations may lead to reopening more businesses across the state and the county. More on these major developments in a moment. But first, two more people have died in San Diego County from COVID-19 bringing the total now to 211. There have also been 110 new cases. This as efforts ramp up with new testing centers opening. Here's KPBS reporter Eric Anderson. San Diego County's mobile testing station was deployed at SDCCU Stadium, helping the county test people for the COVID-19 virus. People with appointments could drive up and get a coronavirus test without leaving their car. County officials have boosted the number of tests they give above 4,000 a day since Saturday. I think it's important that we expand our testing um, to meet the 5,200 per day because it allows us to meet one of the goals that the governor has set that will allow us to reopen our economy. Testing is a key metric for the governor who says most of the state may be able to start opening up more businesses soon. That includes dining inside restaurants. Gavin Newsom has adjusted the state's guidelines to eliminate the no COVID deaths for 14 days requirement, and it eases the threshold for infections. The county meets the modified metrics that have been uh, shared with us by the state, and we will continue to monitor the required and other metrics to inform our next steps in further opening of local businesses, organizations, and activities to strike a balance between the protection of the public's health and economic viability for our region. Testing is just one part of the strategy. So testing is improving, tracing, uh, we are training and, is, and deploying our, our tracers. We're getting PPP uh, up or PPE up uh, and we're getting it out uh, and we are seeing a significant uh, steady rate of decline over a long period of time in the number of people hospitalized and in our ICUs. Uh, all of those very good trend lines. And very good trend lines are measured in part by increasing the number of people being checked for the disease. drive through testing stops like this one are a key part of San Diego County's strategy to get more testing in the county. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. The governor also hinted that the state is only a few weeks away from lifting restrictions to allow churches and hair salons to reopen. And professional sports could make a comeback in June, but without fans in the stands. Tomorrow, the San Diego Board of Supervisors will take up an accelerated reopening proposal. Now that the governor has eased criteria, local restaurants will soon be able to welcome dine-in customers. Coming up, we'll take a look at what you can expect. San Diego County is getting $334 million from the federal government to help with its coronavirus response. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says two county supervisors have ideas on how to spend it. Local restaurants and small businesses suffering under the coronavirus lockdown may get some relief from the county's share of stimulus dollars. Supervisors Nathan Fletcher and Diane Jacob are proposing a $17 million economic stimulus fund to be set up by the county's chief administrative officer. I know I've been in conversations with the Restaurant Association about a number of things we might do to support restaurants, uh, but we're asking the CAO to come back to us uh, in 45 days with a plan to allocate that $17 million uh, and the hope is that we could plug some holes in areas that are not covered by state or federal funding, uh, but we could be mindful of the need for economic assistance and development. 
With schools closed and teachers separated from students, reports of child abuse are down sharply, but that doesn't mean the abuse isn't happening. So the supervisors are proposing another $2 million for increased child welfare visits. And $15 million would help mental health and addiction treatment programs improve their telehealth services. Uh, I have long thought that telemedicine, uh, especially around behavioral health, is something we should embrace more fully. And so we think that this is not only right to do in the, in the crisis environment we're in and will be in for, for, for the near future, uh, but we think that this is a, uh, a, a systemic change that, that can, uh, can reap benefits moving forward. Under the plan, smaller cities in the county would also get reimbursed for pandemic-related expenses. The Board of Supervisors is scheduled to discuss and vote on how to spend its federal stimulus dollars tomorrow. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Big crowds showed up on the first day of Viejas Casino and Resort reopened to the public. American flags lined the way as a line formed to get inside. Everyone had their temperature checked and were required to wear masks at all times. Viejas provided video from inside the casino. Bingo and poker will remain closed as part of the phased reopening. Table games will be limited to a maximum of three players and every other slot machine will be turned off to encourage space between players. We are told they reached capacity at 11 o'clock this morning. One man told us he planned to wager some of his federal stimulus money. We had nothing else to do and this is the first casino that opened. And we're tired of spending our money on lottery tickets. <laughs> That's the truth. Three other casinos in San Diego County will also reopen this week. Suquan Casino Resort will open on Wednesday. Hamul Casino will open on Thursday. And Valley View Casino and Hotel on Friday. A program that aims to get meals to seniors from local restaurants during the pandemic kicked off over the weekend. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman spoke to the owner of one eatery who says it could help save her business. The pandemic's been really tough on us, as it has been for many restaurants. We're just bleeding money. The Trails Eatery in San Carlos is a restaurant that before COVID-19 relied almost entirely on dine-in sales. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You take care. Okay. You too. After closing for seven weeks, they've now become takeout only. It's been hit or miss. Um, either we're really slow or we're really busy. Um, and that's really tough because we have to prepare food. I have to put labor on. So when the state announced the program providing three meals a day for seniors from local restaurants, owner Stacy Poon Kinney signed up right away. As soon as I heard about it, I realized that this could really be a game changer for us. That's partially because majority of Poon Kinney's customer base are seniors. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to eat here a lot. So. I appreciate it. Now the county has assigned her 20 seniors to cook and deliver three meals a day to. The extra business for restaurants could keep places like the Trails Eatery from having to close their doors. These 20 clients are ultimately the difference between us being able to stay open for the long term, hopefully, and us shutting down. Like it, it's a make or break situation. Restaurants can be reimbursed up to $66 a day per client. The idea is to help seniors in need while also giving extra business to struggling restaurants. And it's helping our local farmers because they're requiring us to buy from local farmers and that's super awesome. Like it's just such a win, win, win. Meals have to be nutritious and must include fruit or vegetables and no sugary drinks. The meal program is being paid for with money from the federal government, state and county. It's currently scheduled to end next month, but could be extended. Now that it's in place, now that it's going, I really hope that there's funding for it to continue past June 10th. Great Plates Delivered is designed for seniors who aren't using other meal assistance programs like CalFresh or Meals on Wheels. People can call 211 to sign up. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. As Californians lose jobs and go back to school, community colleges will play a pivotal role in our recovery. KPBS education reporter Joe Honk spoke with administrators about how they will serve more students with less funding. They directly impact public education and our teachers. The revised budget unveiled by Governor Gavin Newsom last week shows that education will be taking severe cuts in the coming year, with community colleges hit especially hard. In San Diego County, colleges expect as much as 10% of their budgets to be cut. Some are fearing a repeat of the Great Recession. Enrollment um, was at its highest when we were at our lowest revenue rate. Kindred Murillo is the superintendent of Southwestern College in Chula Vista. People that are unemployed, they come back to community college to get retrained, retooled, and um, find a way to get back into the workforce. 
But because of the way community colleges are funded in California, more students paying tuition won't mean more money for colleges. In many states, what you just described uh, does happen, that as the enrollment grows, you can guarantee that you'll be funded for it, but not in California. Constance Carroll is the chancellor of the San Diego Community College District. In California, there's a fixed amount, there's a ceiling uh, beyond which you will not be paid, even if uh, your enrollment um, uh, just sort of skyrockets beyond uh, your budget. This will mean bigger classes, fewer course offerings, and maybe even the elimination of programs. If we take a $10 million uh, reduction, we'll be looking at reductions across the board. Including Jack Kahn is the vice president of instruction at Palomar College. And the irony of what's happening now is that, you know, as we're predicting a recession, the in, in California, the institutions that are best suited to serve people in a recession will be gutted. The HEROES bill is passed. All these community college officials agree that the new stimulus package passed by the U.S. House last week would be a huge help. But with President Trump threatening to veto that bill, there is no saying right now when or if help will arrive. Joe Hong, KPBS News. Thousands of undocumented immigrants will receive up to $1,000 from the state government starting today. The payments are drawn from a $75 million cash assistance program launched by Governor Newsom last month. It's meant to help some of the 2 million undocumented people in California who were left out of the government's previous stimulus programs. Jewish Family Service will be processing cash assistance requests in both San Diego and Imperial counties. They say they've gotten over 10,000 calls since this morning. Clearly, the word has gotten out. Uh, and I, I would tell you that when you know people see this report, that if they haven't called already, they should call immediately because while the program is scheduled to run through the end of June, um, I, I would be surprised if it runs through the end of this week. There is more information about the program on the Jewish Family Service website. Eight more sailors aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt have tested positive for COVID-19. In all, 15 crew members have tested positive since returning to the aircraft carrier. More than 1,000 sailors were infected in an outbreak in March. Despite the most recent setback, the Navy is preparing the San Diego-based carrier to return to active operations. The USS Kidd remains in San Diego after an outbreak of coronavirus. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh talked to the medical team about what it was like to tackle the virus at sea. The Navy destroyer was directed to San Diego at the end of April, about a week after the first members of the crew of 330 tested positive for COVID-19. The ship had been on a counter-drug mission off the coast of South America. Commander Michael Kaplan was part of the initial Navy medical team flown to the kid from Jacksonville, Florida. He spoke with KPBS from quarantine in San Diego. Somewhat of a surreal situation. Uh, we didn't really have much time to think about what we were getting into, which is probably a good thing. Um, not too many people would probably want to run into a burning bil building, and that's probably the best analogy. 30 to 40 sailors were already showing symptoms. The ship's medical crew had isolated them and ordered additional testing throughout the ship. Kaplan's team brought equipment to test the entire crew. It took us about three and a half days to get everybody on, on board, over 300 people tested, um, because we realized every minute that we had was time that we could potentially use to try to reduce the spread. As with the Navy's other outbreak on board ship, the USS Roosevelt, the doctors found about half those who tested positive showed no symptoms. That creates an added challenge. There are a lot of challenges with this virus that we don't fully appreciate at this point. The Navy isn't releasing the exact figure, but the estimate is at least a third of the crew has been diagnosed with the virus. The 15 worst cases were moved to the San diego base USS Macon Island, which has a larger hospital. Within days, the ship was in San Diego, where it's undergoing a deep cleaning. The crew was moved to quarantine, part of the Navy's evolving effort to combat COVID-19 on board its ships. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. And we're following all of the latest coronavirus developments for you at kpbs.org. Just click on the tracking COVID-19 link on our homepage and you'll be taken to a page with all of our recent reports. A cool and breezy start to the week and there's even a chance of rain. Mark Macuso has your forecast. 
Uh, late season storm will bring us uh, some more light rain through the overnight into the early morning hours. Uh, more cool and breezy conditions right into Tuesday. And then as we take a look ahead, finally Wednesday and Thursday, some normalcy. Uh, we'll see dry conditions and it will be a little bit warmer. Taking a look at our weather pattern, well, we've seen a, another trough approach. And with that, we've seen the cooling, we've seen the onshore flow, the clouds, and now the showers are moving in as well. We'll follow that upper low as it drops down here through Southern California. Uh, there it is right overhead on Tuesday, but it will be on the move. So on Wednesday starts to lift out. Uh, but Tuesday <laughs> really looks cool and breezy. And there's a future cast showing us a little bit of wet weather around for tonight and uh, perhaps into the, the morning hours as well. And there'll be plenty of clouds too. Checking on the, uh, the wind situation, uh, gusty winds in the mountains and uh, we do have some wind advisories in effect. Taking a look at the temperatures for tonight, we'll be in the mid 50s, Oceanside, Escondido, El Cajon's at 58 and uh, 52 in Ramona. And notice a little bit of wet weather coming through the area for tonight. Uh, for tomorrow, starting off with plenty of clouds and maybe a few leftover light showers. Then we'll see some brightening. Brago Springs 81, El Cajon 72, Oceanside 70, so below average temperatures. Then by midweek, uh, the trough lifts out and we'll see temperatures start to rise. As we take a look at the temperatures here along the coast, uh, uh, looks pretty nice here. Wednesday and Thursday, a little bit cooler Friday into Saturday. Inland areas, uh, pleasant Wednesday and Thursday. In the mountains, a little bit cool, 50s and lower 60s. And as we take you to the deserts, uh, nice and warm Thursday and Friday, but notice a touch cooler Saturday. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Mark Mancuso. Restaurants across San Diego are preparing to open for dine-in service as soon as they get the go-ahead from the governor. But as KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser explains, dining in the coronavirus era will look very different. Every table, six feet apart. PJ Lamont walks around his restaurant, Raglan Public House in Ocean Beach. Bar seating, we're most likely not going to be able to do, period. Um, that's, that's one of the pending items right now. He's furiously getting ready for whenever his five restaurants in San Diego can open for dine-in service. Everything will be in a sealed container. The host will then bring that as well as rolled silverware to the table more than likely with either gloves or tongs. There are other preparations they're making too. For um, all staff um, that's currently working, when you come in, you have to have your face covering already. We have gloves here, we have sanitizer and hand washing stations here. Before they clock in for their shift, um, we do a temperature check on them. Anything over 100 and uh, they go home. In Washington state, restaurants will have to keep logs of customer phone numbers and email addresses as part of a statewide contact tracing program. Would Lamont do it? Want? No. Um, if they require it, yes, we'll do it. Um, it's just one of those things. Once you give up one more little piece of freedom, are they always going to have us doing that? And I personally don't want to be the one holding all that information of other people. Right now, there are a lot of efforts in terms of thinking, you know, how, how do you stem transmission? How do you... Um, control this outbreak quickly. A.L. Oren Especially is an epidemiologist at San Diego State and used to run the contact tracing program for King County in Washington State. He says it's never been done before, but a log of restaurant customers would be helpful. We know that highly effective contact tracing and case isola isolation is paramount to controlling this kind of outbreak and that the probability of effective control decreases as you have a longer delay from, let's say, someone being symptomatic to their getting isolated to um, if, if people around them are not quickly found, right, traced. Still, he says the privacy concerns would be difficult for Americans. You do get into some privacy issues, I believe, when you start keeping track of who's coming through the doors. Greg so Frazier with Stone Brewing not. says they'd follow the state's rules, but won't create their own system. They are making many other plans, marking six feet on their walkways and preparing their table layouts on their massive grounds in Escondido and Liberty Station. They're also planning to use an app called GoTab. They are a contactless ordering platform 
Um, and what that means is, you know, people will be able to come in, scan a QR code to be able to get their, not only the menu on their phone, but they'll actually be able at that point to open up a tab. If someone wants to come out and go to a restaurant, it's because they want to enjoy themselves. Back at Raglan Public House, the owner Lamont has figured out a way to keep a good atmosphere, even with social distancing. Instead of what we have here, where, where you see a chair and that's where seating will be available, we're just going to fill up the other tables with giant stuffed animals. He says with spaced out tables, it looks too bare. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. President Trump says he is taking a malaria drug to lessen the severity of coronavirus symptoms should he become infected. He says he has been taking hydroxychloroquine for about a week and a half as well as a zinc supplement. Hydroxychloroquine has not been approved to be used to fight symptoms of COVID-19 and could cause significant side effects. Trump has repeatedly pushed the drug as a potential cure for the virus against the advice of medical professionals. Today, a biotech company announced it may be a step closer to finding a coronavirus vaccine. Moderna, which partnered with the National Institutes of Health, says it is seeing promising results in human trials. So far, between 60 and 100 people have been vaccinated. The company measured antibodies in eight of those people, and all eight developed neutralizing antibodies. These antibodies were proven to be able to block the ability of the virus to infect cells. We are already seeing an immune response at the level of people who've been infected with this virus and are believed now not to uh, be susceptible to further disease. Moderna will begin large-scale clinical trials in July. If those studies are successful, there could be a vaccine on the market sometime between January and June of next year. However, medical experts caution it may be years before the vaccine is perfected. Many researchers are studying the way COVID-19 acts in the human body, but what about how it acts in the environment? A team of researchers at SDSU led by viral ecologist Dr. Forrest Rower has been awarded a research grant to learn how the virus mutates and spreads in our everyday environment. One big question. Are there reservoirs where the virus is thriving that could lead to future outbreaks? By gathering samples from all over the county, they hope to have enough data to know that. But San Diego is so large, the researchers need your help. They're calling on citizen scientists to be part of the effort. Dr. Rower says they will deliver test kits to the public to collect samples in their own area. What I'm more interested in are surfaces that people interact with that are not really uh, routinely cleaned. I don't really want people going out looking for it. I want people to be sampling things that they're regularly interacting with that might be a, a reservoir of the virus. There are little swabs that you can, um, you put a little bit of detergent on them and you swab some area that you think uh, might be important for, uh, for transmitting the virus. And then you just take that little swab and put it into a solution that inactivates the virus. And then once you're done sampling, um, call us and we come and collect them. Researchers are looking for about a thousand citizen scientists who can apply to get custom test kits delivered to their door. The website is coralandphage.org. And there is no timeline on the project to make sure volunteers don't rush the process or limit themselves to one area. UCSD graduate Marvin Choi just had his first film, A Night's Tour, released digitally on iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. KPBS film critic Beth Accomando has this review and speaks with the filmmaker about the journey. Six years ago, I donated to a Kickstarter from filmmaker Marvin Choi because I was so impressed with his UCSD student film that I wanted to make sure I knew when his first feature would be done. My name is Henry Lamont. Joseph Dauber, but everyone just calls me JD. Kickstarter is interesting because uh, a lot of people view Kickstarter as a, as a source of like, oh, hey, it's free money. But what it really is, is you're actually deciding to temporarily have a full-time job. And it's a lot of work, but it's, it's gratifying because you start off knowing that you kind of have 
someone of an audience already built in. So you already are starting to make a film for somebody. It's not just for yourself. And I want it to be something that not only am I proud of, but that's something I, I know my Kickstarter backers would be happy to see. It was a long wait, but I'm not disappointed. A night's tour is set in a near future devastated by a viral outbreak. Although conceived before this current pandemic, the film addresses issues of isolation, loneliness, and stress that ring eerily true as we shelter at home. There's always the threat of other people coming from the outside world, right? Because Henry hadn't really ever seen anyone for such a long time. So that's kind of what the setting is. It's these two characters who are very different um, because JD is a lot more outgoing. He wants to be a traveler. He is younger, whereas Henry is an older guy who has basically been living by himself in isolation for a number of years. And if you put them together, I wanted to see what would happen if these two extreme types of characters are put together. And that's essentially the movie. So as you search for digital content in quarantine, consider supporting this well-crafted psychological drama from a UCSD alum. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.